All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the Mesa City Council study session for February 29th, 2024. Uh, Mayor Giles is out of town and is excused for this meeting. We have all other council members uh, here present. Uh, we'll get into the agenda. Uh, item number one is to review the agenda uh, for the Monday, March 4th meeting. Uh, let's go through the agenda. Uh, council, any questions or comments uh, on that agenda? Uh, council Member Spilsbury. Um, 4B, I just, is that huge increase from 50 to 800,000 just inflation costs or what, what um, accounts for that huge increase? Right. I think we have somebody from Fire. Yes, sir. Morning. I suppose the one above it also is a million dollar increase, but I just, anyways, just wondering what the reasons are. Originally, when we put in the uh, the cradle points, which are a dual modem in, in the pickup trucks or in the fire trucks, we went out to RFP, and then this fifty thousand was when a new vehicle came online we could buy ones or twos at a time but now we're coming up on life cycle uh next year next two years and with the increase of a of 11 e1 vehicles uh fire trucks coming this year i'll easily go past that fifty thousand. so so was it just something that we didn't foresee happening this budget cycle or i i i'm just it's just seems like that would have been an obvious um, maybe estimate or something. So I'm just wondering. Well, originally these, these vehicles we're getting were on about a two to three to four year cycle. But then we've got word that there's 11 coming by the end of and this calendar. And that was what was year. unforeseen. It's so, not the cost, it's more. More, more of them. And we just didn't know we were going to be able to get that many more. Well, yes, ma'am. We originally, like I said, it was spread out over a three or four year period, but now. They just came online. Vehicles, is that what you're saying? No, these, these are, are all diesels coming. And then I also uh, have okay. ambulances coming, and I know there's probably a request. So the lead time on some of these either. vehicles to purchase them are months, if not years. And so it's, it's, I think what's happened is now they're all coming in. Okay. And so, so he just has to have the funding to, to set up. This is driven more by the vehicles being delivered, which is a good thing. Okay. And we're getting them. Faster. We're just now. He all we're doing here is just outfitting them with the cradles and the everything that goes for the computer yeah, system. Yeah. All right? the all the radios are in the Motorola part, right. uh, and Ken Woods are also in the radio part. And so these the, are the bad news is yes. I mean, it's an increase, but it's a volume increase. The good news is the, the vehicles are coming in now. Okay. So so recently on the uh, AT and T outage last week. Fire runs a dual air card. Other agencies were affected where their MCTs uh, did not work, their, their terminals in their vehicles. With us using AT&T and Verizon, we were not impacted at all. Wow. So these again will take us to a 5G version of the 4G version we have now in the vehicles. Okay. Well, I might just add to Council Member Spilsbury, trying to, well, I kind of understand what's going on, but we have some ambulances chassis already that we've purchased and now we're going to put those in service so we not only have ambulances but then additional fire trucks that will be coming, engines and ladders <laughs> as well as other miscellaneous units. So I think to your question is we did know that these units are coming. Now that they're here, we've got to spend the monies to equip them with the proper uh, computer equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. And, and uh, the ambulances that are coming this month, that stuff is already here. Yes. And ready to go, but then there's future ambulances. Uh, and again, the E1 order got super accelerated. Faster. So, yeah, so we're just appropriating the monies for today and for tomorrow's vehicles. Okay. Yeah, just really appropriating the ability to spend the money. The money comes with the vehicles when they come here to council. But uh, if I don't have that limit on my credit cards, I can't spend it. <laughs> Council member Summers. <laughs> so related to that, are we finding that these vehicles and the chassis are, are moving faster in the supply chain to us? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, again, E1, uh, I'll say that E1. accelerated these eight that were years out 
and have promised them by the end of this calendar year. Yeah, eight new trucks, that's, that's good. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good portion yeah, of the fleet. No, so and, and some of this Motorola and that time uh, frame to order it is not as quick as the trucks are, so I gotta get it ordered. And how quickly are we able to, to outfit these with the, with the computer systems and everything that goes with them? We, uh, we had a delay with PD and on cars. For a long time, are we able well, to? The delay on PD was not the delay in getting them done. The delay was, it was contractors. We a huge. We well, we surged it right. We saw an opportunity to buy a bunch of Tahoes, and we did more than we needed to put out on the road every day. So that misperception was we were behind. The, the correction was we actually had a whole bunch of delivery of Tahoes, and because we saw an opportunity financially to go buy a bunch of Tahoes, now we're moving them out. You know, we've had some issues with vendors, but we're moving them out the door at the rate that they were always anticipated to be. What happens, people saw all these Tahoes sitting in the parking lot and they thought, oh, goodness, the city can't get their job done. Well, no, the city did a great job of taking advantage of pricing and putting in and surging in a bunch of Tahoes. Now I think there's only like, it was less than 27 that are sitting there now. So Excellent. that's taking place. So the problem in the market right now with automotive, whether it's parts or vehicles, the, the supply chain is totally messed up and has been messed up for the two, last two or three years. So we've had to order vehicles that we know we're going to need three years from now today, right? And then some of the ones we ordered for that we thought we were going to get today are being delayed. And sometimes they come in the pace we're expecting and sometimes they just all of a sudden they break through because what happens is people put the orders in and then when it's time to pay, they pass or something happens. Mm -hmm. And so they just keep going down the list. Luckily for us, financially, we've been in a position to say, we'll take everything you got. Now, that means it doesn't necessarily, we'd love for it to come in at a pace that meets, you know, as the vehicle is being retired, it goes out the door and the next one comes right in. That's all like <laughs> thrown yeah, up in the air right now. So that's how we're, we're trying to adjust to this kind of, sometimes we get a few and sometimes we get a whole bunch. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that when we do that, we surge, just to bring it back to topic, that we're going to purchase this equipment and we can get it installed quickly and put these new vehicles into service. What, your installation to get this in is how fast is that? Uh, it's roughly a couple of weeks. So, Councilman, <laughs> oh, wow. when, when, uh, when a vehicle's being built, I send, I order these items. Yeah. I send, let's, let's go with a fire truck. I send all the antennas, I send the remote radio cables, I send all that to the manufacturer. So when the vehicle comes in, all my cabling is under the appropriate location. So we just install the radio, we install the actual cradle point device itself. We don't have to open the overhead, we don't have to cut the roof, all that's done at the manufacturer, both for ambulances and for these fire trucks. I, I I think it makes sense to increase this budget to have that equipment so that we don't have that same experience where we we have to wait to put engine companies in service because we don't have all the equipment that goes inside the fire truck. So this is a good to get ahead of it before the order. Uh, yeah, this comes is just in. he needs the, the fine, he needs the funding capacity to order this yeah. equipment. Yeah, that's very good. Well, this is good. All right. Any other questions on the agenda? Uh, Councilmember Spilsbury. Um, I just was wondering if someone can tell me what a map of dedication means on 7A. I just don't know what that means. I've never seen that term. Uh, Vice Mayor Heredia, uh, Council. So this is a process that we go through in order for the Gateway um, <coughs> Boulevard Road to be dedicated as a right-of-way so that that road can be built as part of that development that was approved. So a map of dedication is just where that right-of-way will go that the city will build that road on. Okay, I could obviously f um, kind of assume all of that, so I just didn't know if um, there were any other things about that type of a term that I just, you know, other th that's, as, that's as simple as it is. It's as simple as it is, Council Members feels very. Okay, great, thank you. Council Member Summers. Uh, the only thing I have, uh, remove 6P from the consent agenda, please. 6P, perfect. This is intro. No, says, not, uh, no oh, intro sorry. was last sorry. week, yeah. Yeah, I put it back on last week. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? 
All right, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to other items on the agenda for the study session. Uh, item 2A is a presentation and discussion of the Planning Division's 2024 work plan. Got Mary and Rachel. Good morning, Vice Mayor, Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to go through the Planning Division's 2024 work plan. Each year the Planning Division comes in and based on what the City Council uh, strategic priorities are, we look to make sure that the projects that we're looking to work on through the year from the long range and the historic preservation uh, perspective are uh, aligning with what the Council has identified. So today we'll go over just a quick um, overview of the division. We'll talk a little bit about our strategic goals for the division, some of our recent accomplishments, and then the 2024 work plan. So in looking at the planning division, we there are three sections of our team. We have the long range team that evaluates and updates our general plan, zoning code, uh, land use policies. We work with our other city departments on tax amendments. Uh, we coordinate the land use and growth strategies with economic development, our transportation team, and other departments as necessary. And we engage the public so that we're making sure that the long range plans are meeting the, the expectations of our residents. The current planning team is the team that reviews the development applications, and that's a lot of what the city council sees from the planning team. And we ensure compliance with the city's general plan and all of our regulations, including the zoning ordinance. The third portion of the section of the, the planning division is the historic preservation team, and they protect and preserve our historic and cultural assets, and they provide support and education to the community on, an, on the importance of historic preservation in the city. Overall for the division, our, our strategic goals, and this is based on the strategic plan that we've worked um, within our department on, is we, we've identified three goals for our team, and that is to improve the customer experience, to provide efficient and effective case processing and review, and to strengthen the long range planning function of the team. I'm going to pull my, this slide up so I can read these numbers. So we wanted to kind of do a summary of some of the applications that we've seen over the last uh, five, uh, four years, five years, from 2019 to 2023, just to give the council an idea of, of what we see in terms of the volume of the applications coming in. So the total num number of applications from 2019 to 2023, those are the blue bars that you see. And you, you, you can see that in 2021 and 2022, we saw a surge in the number of applications. Um, the, the purple bar is showing the number of applications that we've actually processed to completion. So those are projects that were approved either by, either administratively by the Planning and Zoning Board or by City Council. And as you can see in 2023, we're, we're pretty even in terms of the numbers that were coming in and the numbers that were going out. <clears throat> We also wanted to just summarize the types of applications that we're seeing. So you can see from 2019 to 2023, just a little bit of difference. The, the first is that in our pre-submittals, the pre-submittal number has, has gone down um, in 2023 from what we saw back in 2029, but we're seeing that like our planning and zoning cases, those numbers are increasing. Everything else is, is is somewhat remaining stable, except we've got a little bit more in our design review. So just this just gives you a little bit of a breakdown of the kinds of cases that we're seeing that we're processing and completing each year. Mary, can you interpret this a little bit more sure. for us? Is this, are we seeing a decrease in the overall numbers? This is in percentage. So are we seeing a decrease in numbers of applications? So if we go back to the previous slide, that will show you the number of applications that were submitted in 2029 was 909. Today, or in 2020, 2023, we saw 833. We did see that surge in 2021 and 2022, and I think that that was something um, that a lot of jurisdictions saw through that COVID period, just a lot of those applications coming in. What you'll notice is that the completion of those applications in 2020 and 2021, probably again because of COVID and some of the restrictions we were in, those weren't getting completed. So they may have kind of piled up to the point where now what's coming in is similar to what's going out. Oh, okay, so we're back to a balance, whereas before it, there was it's a, a lot of it's, speculation perhaps that just never came to fruition. It, that's potentially yes. 
Yeah, and, I'll, and I'll say the difference between this, this chart for 2019 to 2023. In 2019, we had a lot of pre-applications, so it's those kind of scoping projects where people are considering coming in with formal applications. But now we're seeing a lot less of that and a lot more of those formal applications actually coming in for processing. And the ones that come in have a tendency to go all the way to completion, I think is what you were saying before. Perfect. So, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I Councilmember Spurlsbury and Councilmember Goforth. I wanted to clarify that too. So the big discrepancy of completion versus submitted um, isn't necessarily that we didn't complete them, but that maybe people that was pre-submittal or they pulled it or something. Councilmember Spurlsbury, that's correct. As, as Rachel indicated, that number of pre-submittals was very high back in 2019, and it's it's. Um, been reduced in what we saw in 2023. So now the, a lot of those are moving forward to that completion. And, and that's what I think you're seeing on this slide. Okay. Council wants to go for it. Just to clarify, so your, your, P, your planning and zoning cases and your pre-submittals should be about even, right? There's like it is in 2023 as a put, that, that's what that means, right? I, I don't there, know that that's is necessarily that the, the case because yeah, explain don't, that don't I, in my mind, it's not linear. It's Correct. not application Correct. comes, it always goes completed. I mean, okay. these sometimes okay. these applications come in and it can take years. months or years, right? It's just a beginning of a process. I mean, this is a, that free, uh, the application submitted can be a very, you know, just beginning of a process. So there's no correlation. Yeah, there's don't, don't, it's not an inside, it comes in, goes right out. Yeah. It's, they can stack up. We have years where you have lots of uh, applications, but people just aren't executing. The market's not there. They're just trying okay. to, the property's there. They want to reserve the entitlement, um, but they're not ready to move on the development. So the fact that it lines up in 2023 is not necessarily, okay. Because there's a big fee. I mean, that to apply, I mean, there's some fees. It's the final application, the completed, mm -hmm. then they're starting to pay. The formal application significant more. Correct. Yeah. dollars. Yeah. Correct. Sorry, what? Councilmember Duff and Spillsbury. And talking about cases, the, the, the criticism we hear from, you know, state people around about development is the time that it takes right the state is making all kinds of bills to get in our business about to, you know to take away any restrictions so they think that it'll quicken the process and give us i guess a good product somewhere in there um so in in your um efficiencies and timeline goals i know projects often you can't say, well, you know, from completion, start to completion is X amount of time because that really is also de dependent on that developer and how much time they take in getting back with the revisions that were re required. Um, but within our um, review time, so let's say they did make the revisions or whatever, do we have a goal as far as the turn time and have we been able to meet that? Um, improve on that or something. I would just like to tell the story a little bit more about um, our processes and how they've improved over the time to start erasing some of the ideas that if inefficiencies are over exaggerated. So Vice Mayor Heredia, council members, um, that is a great point because there is that perception that sometimes projects are delayed. So we do have very clear timeframes for the different projects, whether it's a planning and zoning case, a pre-application, um, a board of adjustments case, in terms of when that needs to be processed. Um, we do um, measure that every month, so we, we do report out on that every month, so that we're making sure that we're meeting that, that time frame. Um, there are times when it dips based on, on workload, but generally I would say the planning division is is meeting or exceeding that expectation in terms of the days when a project needs to be reviewed. And, 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 oh, and I would sorry. just say this, because we just met yesterday? Yes, yes I did, <laughs> yeah. So, okay, this is zoning, right? Think about zoning. Zoning is not, here, let me submit my plans, here's the building code, let me check the building code and see if it meets it. Zoning is, can be wide open, right? Are these roads big enough? Is the, you know, the setbacks, the densities, the types of uses? I mean, if it's a rezoning and there's a lot of community involvement and interest, it's not the same, right? It's not as by the book, right? There, oftentimes there's a lot of other conversations and discussions and 
we're waiting for responses and staff is trying to research and make sure the utilities are there and the streets can work and you know do we does this fit in the neighborhood and all these other issues so that we have I mean certainly the staff is trying to be responsive as they can to that but it's not quite the same a lot of times you also hear the discussion and that's why we have to be careful developers have to like be very clear are you talking about the zoning side or are you talking about the building side on the building side we do have you know there's a building code and there's uh, plan reviewers that once it's gone past the zoning and now they're ready to submit their plans then there's a other, whole nother process that sometimes people will be critical of we've gotten much better I was impressed yesterday the, the by being able to digitize a lot of our plans we can really track um, the requests that we're making the changes that are made if the changes are being addressed by the applicant over and over again so I think that is maybe better documented as far as being able to say what we're asking for and what they do zoning can be you know sometimes I even have to get involved in a zoning case right it's like what is the city's you know we're going to defer uh, some roads or types of roads or you know how are the utilities going to be addressed you know we get into issues about density and a whole variety of things are very different that it's not as black and white as a building code so it's really hard to put this I think zoning in every case you know we're working at Fiesta right and we've been working on it for months but it's how many acres 70 80 80 acres 80, of yeah. property right and so but it's one application mm -hmm. no. but it's probably going to take months for us to get through it sure. so Councilman Oh, I wanted to Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, Mr. Brady literally answered everything. What I will add to it is also when we hear this conversation, you sh we do look at the surrounding cities, their review times. We can absolutely say Mesa has one of the strictest and most, I mean, time sensitive review times. So when you hear that, we do compare our review times in Phoenix, um, Tempe. We do have a list, and we are <coughs> absolutely one of the top cities with the most strictest review timelines as well. So, so I guess um, just to clarify this previous slide, then is it possible that some of those um, applications that were submitted would carry over absolutely next oh, yeah. year? Absolutely. So. The, yeah, this graph has a lot of <laughs> uh, information that's not displayed on here, right? So, because there's all those different considerations. Okay, well, and, and Jen, that, yeah, because we hear that all the time. And so I think um, one of the key things that you've said is that we've been trying to get better, too. So I think that maybe some, if they've had an experience in the past or five years ago or something, to, that it's different now than maybe it was five years ago or that we're trying to... Thank you. Increase some of those. So, Vice Mayor Hardy and Councilmember Silsbury, we absolutely are always trying to evaluate. And I know Nana has been working on a on a project of you know reaching out to the developers so we can identify those things that we can do to improve because there's always room for improvement. Um, we want to make it so that we are are helping our applicants and not hindering our applicants. Yeah, and that's what I've been pushing for, as you know, because I want. I want them to feel like we want them to succeed and said that we're fighting them every way. And then um, I also think it's important sometimes too, like it's happened several times over the last few years where I'm told that it took so long, but then when they look up their notes, they'll see that we were waiting on them for, um, or that you guys were waiting on them for pieces of information or to finish something. And so there's just always a little bit more to the story too, I think. So. And um, Vice Mayor Heredia, Council Councilmember Spilsbury, that's absolutely correct. So we turn those projects, our, our reviews around, and I, we're not always 100% in getting those comments out on time. Up, I mean, we definitely are working on that. But then for there, there may be months where we don't get a resubmittal that you know, that adds to the time that it takes mm -hmm. to approve a project. Mm -hmm. And then the story that's told is it took, correct, you know, a year to get an answer. Correct. Or something, yeah. so. Council Member Freeman. Remind me, do applicants have a opportunity to expedite the process? And I know that there were different levels back in the day, Nana, that you could have a, the regular process and then the developer could expedite it in different levels. Of, 
Um, Vice Mayor Heredia, Council Member Freeman. So there are certain application types if they don't have to go to a public hearing that we can expedite those. But once it gets to um, into a public hearing because of the noticing dates and different requirements, sure. we can't expedite those projects. Where you yeah. often hear more about exp expediting is on the building. That's yeah. why I was going to say it's that more on the building side. Where, when you hear developers, are they, <coughs> are you talking about zoning or are you talking about building permit? Yeah. Because they love to mix the two together. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's and they're different, completely different process. Well, just so that we know, there's. Go ahead, Nona. Um, Vice Mayor, Councilmember Freeman, we do have expedited process for the building permit, and that's a quick turnaround time, and we do evaluate. Sometimes we just have too much volume, and sometimes the complexity of the projects also doesn't even lend itself for expediting because by the time they even submit the applications themselves, the, because of the complexity, the application is even incomplete that it will take weeks for us to continue to meet with them to help them put all the stuff together. But in, in a normal sense, we do have that quick um, expedited process for building permits. Okay, thank you. Council Member Duff? Um. Thank you for the uh, previous explanation on the um, processing. So is there, I often hear of delays and such on a, how we go about reviewing plans with other departments, right? It comes in and you have your plan and your review, and, but then it has to go to transportation and then it has to go to solid waste and maybe then it has to go to fire or public safety, things like that. Is there? Anything in there that we're doing differently or can do differently in order so that it doesn't have to be like department by department by department? <laughs> to, to, um, Vice Mayor Herity of Council, I'll start and then I'll let Rachel add to this. We um, actually do have what we call an internal development review meeting every Monday morning where um, we have representatives from transportation, um, infrastructure, um, Robert Avadak and our team, he coordinates with solid waste, with fire, so that we are all reviewing the plan at the same time. So it's not like it comes into planning and then we shoot it out and then we don't wait, you know, we wait to hear from them to get their comments. So there is this coordinated review that, that does occur on every project as it comes in. Um, I'll let Rachel, maybe if you wanted to add anything, and then I don't know, probably Nana wants to talk a little bit about that yeah. too. Uh, Council Member Duff, I, I, Mary covered most of it, but I was gonna say within our normal um, review timeline, so for, for example, for planning and zoning and for design review applications, that's a two week review period. We have both the planning and we have our external reviews that are happening at that same time. So when applicants get comments, it is a complete package of comments from all city departments. Vice Mayor, Council Member Dab, um, we, we do recognize that uh, we could also improve in our communication by helping the development community to actually go to the right person. Sometimes what happens is they will come start a centralized process, but then they will branch out and begin to contact the various departments without really keeping the core group involved. So by the time they may pick up a phone, talk to somebody else, and by the time it gets to the core group, it may have taken weeks because they are expecting us to really communicate to each other. We do, but there's definitely a way that we can improve. So for the past year, the direction I got from Mr. Brady actually is to work with all the teams and also find ways that we can improve our services. It's an ongoing project right now that we actually have a meeting coming up with findings that we have as to ways that we can improve that we're going to make that recommendation to um, Mr. Brady and move on. Yeah, but it, it just something here in council, it's, um, it really is also incumbent upon developers. Um, we really encourage them before they even make an application to go spend time with staff and do like a pre-application discussion um, because it's not fair um, if they're going to be making significant changes to the street alignments, to the width of streets, and or if it's utilities and how the utilities are going to be delivered to the site. Um, so if these other departments are getting involved, it's to make sure it integrates with the existing infrastructure, road systems, um, all those things have to be in consideration as part of a zoning case. So we try to, you know, Robert Apodoc is kind of our lead guy. He's, I told him again yesterday, you're the man uh, to coordinate. But Robert can't make the decision for 
the streets about whether the street <coughs> profile, these cross sections that are being proposed, are are you know sustainable or are within what we would want for the, what we approve for the city. So there's just a lot of discussions trying to get these developers. They're trying to do the <coughs> least amount that they can. We're trying to build out the city for generations. They just want to do the minimum amount they can in front of their property. Um, so we have those discussions. The other discussion takes place is quality, right? Quality discussions do not happen overnight, right? We, we push and pull, you know, about the, those discussions. So there's all this infrastructure discussion, there's the zoning land use discussion, and then there's a whole discussion about does this, pro this project fit from a quality standpoint? So, yeah, um, frankly, I don't, I get it. We need to do best we can in processing. But I'm not going to apologize. We're going to take our time because we got to get it right, right? And so you hear that from our community. Um, we can't just, you know, we want to expedite, but we also want to be very clear that we're making the right decisions. Because once that development goes in, if the road isn't configured the way it needs to be, the water sewer's not there. Guess who's? It's the city that later will have to come in and, and fix all that for sure. Um, I appreciate um, these comments and as we go forward I think a lot of times the things I hear about well developers are more sof 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 I can say the word sophisticated and understanding the processes and what goes on but sometimes we have more of the small person you know the small development or individual development just getting a one-time thing going on and I think a lot of times they're talking to the wrong person because they're like, I didn't hear back, I didn't hear back. So I think having that point person or, or someone to make sure they're getting to the right department because I think they get kind of lost in the system. And as we go forward doing more infill development, we're going to have these uh, smaller um, contractors <coughs> or individuals doing projects. And so having that coordination point, I think, would really help instead of feeling like yeah. they, they don't understand the system and they don't know where to go, let alone, you know, use it on the computer. It's kind of very intimidating. Perfect. And, and I'll chime in. Uh, I think, I think um, the, ten, the tone of the conversation right now at the state level really look, is looking at, you know, local municipalities as an issue around specifically housing, right? Uh, and that's something that I think we're covering here as far as how we have a process that looks at not only adding more housing, which is important, but also the quality, the connectivity, like how it works with the neighborhood, because unless it's vacant land in the, we have very little vacant land now, but it, most of the, the developments that will happen are around communities or businesses, and so it's got to be con congruent with what's around it. So, I think it, it's it's important to uh, keep emphasizing the um, the importance of of building and having these conversations uh, that uh, we don't. Because again, going back to the tone, it's trying to eliminate the. Uh, the voice of uh, local municipalities at the state level to have this conversation about quality, something that will last generations, not you know eight to ten years, where you know we we've seen some of these developments that have happened in the past that are deteriorating much faster than they should be. Right, so I think it's an important aspect uh, to keep on working on and and always getting better. Uh, as a city, but also uh, ensuring that you know some of the misconceptions that are out there about cities and the processes uh, are because of making sure these these developments last a long term, right? Like everybody sh it, it should deserve something that they can stay there for a long time, not something that is going to deteriorate uh, fast. So I think that's. That's something that uh, we should keep an eye on on the state level because, especially on housing, again, that's some of the tone that's coming out that cities is a is a problem. Uh, but as we can see here, um, you know, as we get submittals and and, and have those conversations, uh, those things get passed. And, and per my experience in the last six years, I think very few. Developments get snagged up in the process 
it's more market factors, right? As far as funding or interest rates or COVID pandemic <laughs> or other pieces that uh, are affecting some of these developments, right? Like on the housing front, we've over two years, we've uh, I think 6,000 units that we've approved over the last two years, right? So it's, uh, it's something that we need to keep on chiming in on because uh, it, it, at the state level, we're, there, there is a possibility that we will lose some of that voice in the, in the process of developing our, our local neighborhoods and communities for the future, right? So, no, I, 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 I think you're spot on, Vice Mayor, because I mean, if they look at the, the slide that we have right now, we have some fantastic projects that have moved forward, but uh, take the residents at, at Cubs Way. I think there's a, a place for density. We want to see density in downtown. We want to see density along Main Street, but if you, but it doesn't fit. You know, this is a very diverse community. We don't want to. We shouldn't see that in Lehigh. Mm -hmm. Strip of strip the cities of their ability and planning of their ability to, to to plan, and you end up with two very incompatible uses. Sure. You want to? Do you want to put? housing or you know apartments next to a pickleball court that's probably a bad idea <laughs> just to pick a random idea. i think i think, I think phoenix has faced a lawsuit from that uh, but but on the you know, other hand if you put low density uh, at site 17 in downtown what's that going to do for the revitalization of downtown nothing so but i also want to say too for all the complaints that we get um, or we, we, we seem to, to focus on the complaints on planning. Your office has done a fantastic job of responding to people that have concerns. And just as an anecdote, uh, there was a, a, a business owner that wanted to convert a property along Main Street from essentially a dive bar to a working manufacturing center. There was a miscommunication that I coordinated with, with Mary's office, and within a day and a half, they had the keys and they solved the issue and had the keys to the building. So it's, it's, it's a two-way communication. It's, it's planning is a, a thorough, methodical process that protects communities and you know, making sure that we have the diversity of our communities and everything that works in the economic development activity and it's a public safety issue. The fire trucks have to be able to access these sites. So it's a necessary process and sometimes when there's a miscommunication, I found that this office has done a really good job of, of, of solving those issues as quickly as possible. Perfect. Uh, Council Well, ahead. I might as well and we're all talking. Yeah, yeah, I'll just give my two cents yeah. on this. Uh, I, I would just say, you know, sort of more similar to Mr. Brady is I would, no, I would rather not see uh, sacrifice quality for speed. That's not to say I, I you know, I want to bog down the process, but I would rather see a little bit deeper dive in a case by case basis instead of some blanket standards that don't necessarily fit in certain areas. So that that's my I know I've um, I've, I've stated that before. I know why, you know, it's a little bit easier, more efficient to have some blanket standards that we require, but sometimes they just don't fit in case-by-case -case situations. So I, I would rather us extend the process just a little bit to get that um, each case uh, to be, since it is unique, to continue to, to preserve that uniqueness and that character of that area and not require something that maybe not is, is necessary for the, for the Point for now, I understand you have to look decades out, but sometimes that creates um, a, a situation where a neighborhood is shaped in a certain way unnecessarily. So that's all I would say about that. And you guys, I've told you before, I think you do a fantastic job of balancing the, the efficiency and the quality control and, and very responsive when I have constituents with issues. And so thank you. Councilmember so Summers. Bouncing off that, and I completely support Councilmember Goforce's uh, take on this. And looking at this next slide to move along, we have some accomplishments here. Uh, Gateway East is an example of something that took a very long time to get through planning. So not only are we, did we try to put in 
quality aesthetic on the up front. So my question as you move forward in this, go to this next slide, how do we ensure that they are living up to that development agreement and putting in the quality moving forward? All right. Well, finally, we move on to the next slide well, as so. Councilmember <laughs> Summers leaded it, led to it. So thank you, Vice Mayor and Council. So the next part of what we wanted to talk about is just some of the accomplishments of the team that will then work, move into what we're looking to do for the next year. So as Councilmember Summers mentioned, Gateway East was a very large industrial rezoning design standards that we developed for that site that we will look at each and every site plan as it comes into the office to make sure that it is living up to the standards that were identified there. We've got a couple of higher density residential projects. Again, Anton Mesa is uh, in, in uh, District 5. It's a, it was a rezoning and a site plan modification with 550 housing units and some commercial to go with that. Residences at Cub Way, Cubs Way, um, we're looking at 416 units. So we're again seeing that density in, in those appropriate locations. And then the Brickyards was an industrial project where we saw buildings ranging from 35 to 300,000 square feet. So some smaller industrial buildings and some larger industrial buildings. Um, again, always looking at the quality of the design of those projects. Anton Mesa Fiesta is in District 5? I'm, I'm sorry, oh. District 3. Like, I'm sorry. That got past me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, my mistake. I apologize. Yeah, right. <coughs> Thank you for the correction. She's paying attention. Mm -hmm. You don't have Mesa Fiesta in your district. Council Member Heredia was excited yeah, yeah. about it. <laughs> um, so some of the long-range planning um, team accomplishments. Um, we've identified the general plan. That's the big one that we're working on right now. It took a, a lot of our time last year. It will take a lot of our time this year. We've had that extensive public engagement where over 6,000 people throughout the city have engaged. Um, that draft is out for public review and that, that public review actually ends on Monday. If anyone wants to get their comments into us, that would be great. Um, we're working on our Mesa Connected, our TOD, Transit Oriented Development Study. We've worked through the existing conditions portion of that study and we're initiating our community outreach at this point. We've looked at some process improvements. Um, I think this talks to what Council Member Duff had asked about our public participation and public notice processes and then how we streamline and, and simplify some of our processes. And then the zoning code amendments that were completed last year include the drive-through text amendments, some minor site plan um, modifications to, the, to the, the Mesa zoning code, and then the marijuana text amendments which were finalized early part of this year. For the historic preservation team, we um, process 10 certificates of appropriatenesses in our historic districts. So this, these are modifications people are making to their buildings or their sites. Um, and so we evaluate all of those to make sure that we're protecting those historic resources. We completed 22 section 106 reviews. This is whenever we use any federal funding we have to do a, an evaluation of both the historic and the archeological potential impacts. We work through SHPO on these, and so we completed 22 of those reviews this year. There was the Lehigh Heritage Neighborhood designation. That was uh, something that we completed last year. The Nile Theater uh, historic designation, so we have a new landmark in the city. And then there's the celebration of the Historic Preservation Month each year. That'll again be in May of this year where we have the Student Essay and Art Contest. And this year we've extended it from kindergarten all the way up to seniors in, in high school. So we're trying to expand that program. So what does that mean in terms of the 2024 work plan? So we wanted to identify first those things that we're currently working on. So we need to finalize the general plan. That again is our, our priority this year. It will take a, a lot of the time that we've, we've got for our team, our long range team. Um, we wanna continue and, and move forward our, our connected, uh, Mesa Connected study, that TOD study. We're finalizing the text amendments for billboards. Um, in for final action again on Monday. Um, and then we're working through the accessory dwelling units right now. We had our first um, virtual meeting this week. We had 25 participants, um, most of which were pub the public. It wasn't staff, it wasn't council, it wasn't planning and zoning board members. We had a couple of those, but it really was a lot of, of residents who are interested. So we have two more public meetings going for that. We're hoping to bring that to the city council for consideration probably later this year. Probably the middle of this year is, is the time frame we're looking at. And then of course the balanced housing plan. That's a, the second part of it goes hand in hand with the general plan and that I believe is, is coming um, in May. Thank you, Nana. 
So then we had some carryovers from 2023. These were things that were on the work plan that we talked about last year that we just hadn't gotten to just because of time. And I think that a lot of these um, were reinforced at the council strategic planning session, the, the infill, text, infill ordinance, the text amendments, and a resource guide, and the small lot text amendments. Um, and then we're also looking at our subdivision ordinance to do some text amendments. They haven't been updated for quite some time. And so what we wanna do is kind of lift them up and bring them up to date um, in terms of what we as a city should be doing with our subdivisions. And then new for 2024, we're looking to strengthen our development standards as it relates to industrial uses, including data centers, um, the redevelopment plan implementation. And so there are three, three departments that are working on this. And so planning will have a part of that. Um, Nana Jay and Jeff McVeigh are, are uh, coordinating that effort right now. And at, at some point planning will come in and be a part of that. And then the Rio Reimagined, we're working with um, the team on that Rio Reimagined project. Mary, I appreciate you taking this up uh, with the industrial uses. This is incredibly important to, to my district, really specifically, but I think this is going to be related citywide. As has been mentioned, there's not a whole lot of open land available. So what we're going to be seeing is more integration of these uses together and ensuring that industry is a good neighbor to these neighborhoods is incredibly important. I'd like to see um, this particular item move forward rapidly. And I was hoping that because there's a lot of legal ties to it, hoping that Jim would be able to, uh, you'd be able to utilize uh, the resources in Jim's office uh, to move this forward quickly uh, because it's it's pretty important. The, the good news is that in, in doing this too, um, we're starting to see some of these industries um, work with through my office with the community uh, to be on good neighbor policies. And we're gonna see that pretty soon uh, with a, a development that's coming forward is gonna put a good neighbor policy together um, and bring it to council when they redo. We'll, I don't know if they'll go to council, we can talk about it later. Uh, but having those things codified to make sure that it's visually appealing because looking at the back of a tilt up gray battleship of a wall in a neighborhood, I mean, these are, people's homes and their greatest ec economic investment. Um, and, and I just feel that industry, while, while it's appropriate, we want the jobs, we want the technology, they need to be a good neighbor and, and recognize that because it's in <clears throat> backyards. And Council Member Summer, that's why we, we've got it on here. And so yep. those, those design guidelines and standards are something that we, we understand are, are you know, a priority for you, for you based on conversations that we had, which is why we've got it on the work plan for this year. And I think the design guidelines is the right approach to, to tackle this. I really yeah. do. As Thank opposed you. to just a text amendment. Correct, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mary. Mary, quick question. Um, the redevelopment plan implementation, what's, curious, what's the, What's the thought process That's on the that? That's RDAs. I think it's RDAs. But it, it, <laughs> are we looking at um, enhancing those RDAs with different um, things that maybe kind of spur up more redevelopment? These. Uh, well, the RDAs were studies. There's four, five, Three, four, 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 four RDAs. Yeah. Um, so we have a. Um, so the detail of the property and the types of properties, the challenges with blight, yeah. the things, the parcels. So what we need to do is to go into those, we're not gonna be able to take them all at once, right? Is But to take a few of those RDAs and the staff's planning, economic development and downtown transformation specifically are looking at, okay, what, and, it, and in those RDA um, reports from the consultants, it does begin to outline some ideas about yeah. things we can start to work on, right? It's like how, you know, it's like the small lot developments. Mm -hmm. Like, how can we, what can we do as a city to make those developable or even encouraging um, reuse of existing sure. properties? So there's just a lot of groundwork we need to do um, in our process to gather more information. Challenging if a lot of these RDAs is you have these strange lots um, that are not uh, really fit for new development, but also just property ownership is kind of... Um, Fragmented, maybe mm -hmm. that's a better word, yeah. and so trying to assemble property. So, we just think uh, it's an opportunity for staff to go in and to really 
focus in on some of these areas and find the opportunities for low hanging fruit where we could see opportunities to encourage development. Maybe it's just a matter of us connecting property owners and trying sure. to find properties that can be developed out. So we're still working on a variety. Of, and so planning obviously will come into the place, but we it's also an economic development opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Is to be able to talk about what, what could or could not fit here. Um, so um, we're hoping to come back with those RDAs to come back with some recommendations okay. about <clears throat> At some point, it's kind of overwhelming sure. trying to take it all on, and so we're trying to figure out where can we go inside the RDAs and have an impact. That was my question. It's kind of yeah. figuring out what what are the pieces within the RDA that we can yeah. kind of look at that's our, or to spur. That's what I think staff are really trying to figure out. Okay. Councilmember, go. Well, I'm just curious how this is organized within your department because this seems like something, it's not going to go away. You know, our, our city continues to age, right? We're going to, these areas, the areas will continue to pop up, right, where there's uh, redevelopment opportunities. Is this something where you're going to have somebody in, on staff designated to, you know, RDAs in the long term? Or is this like one plan, four areas, oh. and then that's no, it? So, each, I guess. so the RDA is a specific part of the code. Tim, help me with that part. Okay, yeah, so it's this a, isn't. Yeah, okay. it's a, it's. It's governed by state statute, and it, and it looks at blighted areas, and, okay. and it's a statutory definition of blight. Okay. So it includes what you might traditionally think of blight, but it also includes things like what Chris was saying, when you have fractionalized or fragmented property ownership, and so that you can't redevelop. And so it's a it's a study and a formal finding. It comes to council. Council actually finds those areas to be blighted. Oh, so interesting. It's, and what's the purpose of of then there's additional, it. there's additional benefits. It allows us okay. to, uh, to otherwise provide incentives or yeah. resources that okay. we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Yeah. So, so this seems though that you could kind of include this with somebody who does, who's looking at infill. I mean, is the infill just text amendment? It's. I guess I'm just trying to understand the, you know, the or department organization, how we're gonna, tackle this maybe in the long term as, a, as opposed to the short-term project based maybe uh, <laughs> maybe you haven't so gotten that far I don't no, know no I think we're, we're trying to be a, we're, we've kind of felt like we've done the planning mm -hmm. we've done the consultant we've done the inventory we've done the analysis and now it's like let's go find some projects like let's go identify where's the great opportunity to really make a difference to try to um, repurpose some properties going forward and so but we think it's going to it's obvious because they nothing's moved on some of these properties that it's going to take maybe the city at least setting up an opportunity for success and being able to gather property owners and and talk about the challenges but then finding out their motivations and then using the help of planning and economic development we're trying to we're just trying to figure out what resources we can do to help again, redevelop these properties. For sure. I, I guess my point is just that seems like it would, should be ongoing. Like the it, city it is could, not, you know, Oh yeah, no, I mean, there is so much work to be done in these yeah. RDAs, yeah. but it would be an overwhelming amount of resources to try to take it all on. What we're going to try to, we're trying to stay very focused and where we can be successful. And then if we can be successful, how we can repeat that over and over again. Is this any, anything similar to, you know, the city of Phoenix has the, the adaptive reuse department that they set up a few years ago. Is this sort of similar to that? Do you think the work? The, the Vice Mayor, Councilmember, I'm not very familiar, okay. but just to add to it, we've we've been meeting as a group, um, like development services, economic development in downtown, and looking at there is a lot, there is a long list of all things that we need to do. So, what well, the direction we got from Mr. Brady was to group it into sections and see what each department can actually take on. So as I'm talking to you right now, we've divided them into those three categories. So economic development is working on a piece, development services working on a piece and downtown transformation and then going to compile all those things and then make a recommendation. And my the direction we got was to look at certain areas, implement or put those into action and see how successful it is. And then we can basically mimic it for, because it's a lot. We even ourselves got overwhelmed when we combined, looked at all the plans and all the action items. So we've got to start from somewhere. Yeah, That's no, it's great. Yeah. And so, I mean, the first thing they did is they came back to me with a list of um, properties. They thought, oh, we could go 
uh, can we go, should we go look at these properties and start working with the property owners? And some of them I was able to say, well, <coughs> Mervyn's isn't one of them, right? Because we have an overlay of deed restrictions for the next six years, so we can't change that. But yes, let's go talk to these property owners. Let's come up with some ideas. So we are trying, to, we're taking a multi-departmental approach to this, and we hope to come back to council. We're probably are gonna need a few resources where we can dedicate some individuals to really, it's just the follow-up, right? And right. keep following yeah. through on the ideas. So. Just one last question on infill. What, infill text amendments. So what does that look like? What? So, Vice Mayor, um, Council Member Gofor, so it's really looking at ways that we might be able to incentivize and fill within our code. So, looking at ways that we can maybe reduce parking requirements in certain areas, reduce setbacks to really help those kind of smaller parcels redevelop that where it'd be difficult right now under our current code is how can we incentivize mm -hmm. those? I think that's great. And I guess I'm just wondering, so is that is that where you stop? You, you do a text amendment and then is there, are, are there resources within the department? Because those are typically small developers, you know, that, that don't have a lot of experience and need a lot of handholding, right? Don't you think? So do we have somebody in particular that will work on infill that can, can help? Well, that's what we're working on okay. with the staff. It may, that may be part of a, you know, based on the council priority session, yeah. that may be a resource that we mm -hmm. may need to add. Okay, great, thank you. Mary, before we leave that slide, what's what's the status on re reimagined? Do do we have that, or it's just in process? It's been in process no, for all. You should just stay there. Not okay. <laughs> Getting your steps in. Um, so right now, what we've been doing for the past year again, we first of all, we um, we help hire what they call an ambassador, who is coordinating with all those various cities. And a um, couple of months ago, mm -hmm. we also met with them, with the mayor. They are forming a um, nonprofit group that is also going to help basically seek funds and um, opportunities to be able to invest into the project. And um, we are working with them. I think they are coming back next in a couple of weeks. In addition, what we've been doing as well again this is also interdepartmental approach the direction we've got again from mr brady was to bring transportation economic development parks and recreation look at the area and see what we all can actually take on contribute to make sure that we can basically help progress the project so we are looking at so many factors, what is within our control and those that are not within our control that we can also seek help from the group to actually talk to the other entities. Will there be federal assistance as far as funding the, on this or is it left to the city? That's system? part of the plan for the ambassador is to really help us to seek um, federal funding opportunities for the project. All right. Anything else for Nana? No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Okay, so um, the, the next thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about was the historic preservation work plan. And so in process, we have the historic preservation design guidelines and text amendments. We um, are working through some comments that we've received from the State Historic Preservation Office. And so we're looking at probably mid of this year again to, to try to bring those to council for consideration. And then um, in May, we do have Historic Preservation Month where we're looking at developing some tours and to have an event, including that essay and art contest for the students again. Carryovers from 2023 is we really want to work on getting a Section 106 programmatic agreement. I had indicated we did, I think it was 22 106 reviews last year. We want to work with SHPO if we have what's called a programmatic agreement in, in, pro, in place, we're then able to do those 106 reviews without having to consult with, with uh, SHPO. So that's something we really want to get into, in place. And then we've got a lot of resources for our historic preservation team. Um, we're developing some story maps for our heritage neighborhoods. We're doing a photo inventory. We're, we're updating some of the, the uh, inventory sheets for some of our historic districts. So we really want to work on getting those website updates done just so that that resource is available for, for that community. I know we had a recent meeting with them and, and they're really, they're, they're, they really have an appetite to, to have those resources available to them online within our, within our division so that they can maintain those historic resources in the city. 
And then in uh, new for 2024 is we're looking to improve that public outreach. We're now meeting with that community, um, sending out postcards to everybody in those historic districts or if they're a landmark to come to you know public outreach so we can hear concerns that they've had with the processes. Um, we're developing these, we, we call them how-to guides on if I'm a residential or a commercial property, what do I need? What's the process I need for a certificate of appropriateness? We've developed a handout for a certificate of appropriatenesses so that they, they understand what that process looks like, how they can work with us, and where those resources are available. And then, as I mentioned, we're doing the update photo survey of Evergreen and Ropes in um, the historic districts. And so that's an overview of the, the division for the, for the year. And we're happy to answer any more questions you have. Council Member Freeman. Well, you have one more. So this is on the building side, the building permit side. So recently I've received some emails from single family residences that are building their homes on five acre parcels, one acre parcels. And, and I, know, I know you've helped fix the problem, but it seems like some of the recurrent interpretation of some of the building requirements for a single family owner or builder makes it restrictive and costly because of some of the interpretation of staff. I know I'm getting in the weeds here, but well, this isn't plan. This is planning. So you're not talking okay. to, you got to talk to so I was looking for non -end. He's coming. Yeah. But with that, I just, I just appreciate you working with homeowners in the area because in, especially in my district, we do have some infield and some larger parcels, smaller parcels that are being built. So with that said, I, I know I, I lean on you to help fix our problem, and I don't know if the other council districts receive that as well, but those are some of my concerns. Vice Mayor, Council Member Vice Freeman, thank you. I, I, I'm very familiar with that issue. It was actually a requirement. The only issue was the developer had not been asked in the previous years to basically meet those standards. But once that was brought to my attention, I did work with John to really got, get it resolved. Okay. No, just just a heads up on that. And, and I got another one today, so I'll be sending it to you. So, But thank you. That's my only comment. All right. Council Member Summers. So looking at... There we go. So looking at this work plan for the next year, knowing that the budget season is coming up, how are your resources matched for this plan? And what, if anything, do we need to consider for making sure that we can accomplish these? These goals, um, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Member Summers. I, I think from the planning side, we've we've looked at what we think is realistic for us to be able to accomplish this year. And if we go back to the, oops, if we go back to the, um, the planning, the long range, up one more. Um, these are we're we're 100% confident. These are moving forward. These will be completed on the timeframes because these are all in process right now. If we go to the next slide, we have. Preliminarily looked at the next three and the carryovers from 2023. We have to put some resources to those. Um, we're, we're pretty confident we can get those done this year. A lot of it is going to be dependent on the general plan. Again, that is taking a lot of the time for the long range team. So a lot of it is dependent on that. And then we'll be looking to start the, the so we are already working with Nana and his and the other departments on the rearrangement <coughs> agenda. We are assisting with that and that implementation. We will be moving into the redevelopment plan implementation as time allows. And then we have started to do some best practice research on the de, the development standards and design guidelines and and um, standards as it relates to the data centers and industrial parks. So that one has has started. It's not maybe as far along as some of the other ones at this point. Okay. So now the general plan is starting to, well, we're still in it, but it's going to end in April, May, and then send to the voters. We're going to anticipate some resources will be freed up from that to do some of these. Other so things. Vice Mayor Heredia, Council Member Summers, it really, I think that it will keep ramped up at the speed that we've been going, I would say, until at least June. Um, at that point, the, when the election is called and when we know if council has approved it, if the Planning and Zoning Board has made a recommendation for approval, I think at that point it, w it will pull back. And at that point, those resources that are working on that would be available for okay. this. I, I think it's important to make sure that, Nana, that your office has the resources it needs, the personnel it needs to, in, to move things along. For everything from the speed that we talk about to ensuring the quality to doing the planning and the research, uh, it, that takes personnel. So 
as we move forward to budget. I know that we're heading into some tight budget years. You can see it by the shifting of the city manager in his chair. Um, but this this is a, this is an important department for um, economic development and growth. So thank you. I, I guess I would just, sorry. Go ahead. I, I would just add too. I, you know, as as the current planning, I think that's what you call it. Current planning department. The applicant slows. Yep. You can ramp up your long range. So I, you know, I know that to some that slow is maybe a mm -hmm. negative, not a positive. But I see opportunity there when that slows that we can really put some long range planning um, practices in place that you just didn't have time for, you know, and resources. So, Vice Mayor Heredia, Council Member Goforth. I'm, I'm not sure it's it's slowing to the point yet where we can necessarily <laughs> move resources, okay. but we're always looking to evaluate how we can work with our resources to see how we can strengthen that long range team without impacting the applicants because yeah. those applicants, they're on a time frame that we're, we're set to. Yeah. And so we've got to make sure we're meeting the demand of you know our reviews and in, in the amount of time that we have to do it. So we do we do shift resources as as our as we're able to. So there's not a dedicated long range planning team. There there is a dedicated long range Robbins planning is, team. Okay. No so no. Jeff is not actually on the planning in the planning division. He's a project manager within the division. Within a department department oh, um, within the department. Okay. Vice Mayor, um, Council Councilmember go for it. I would say that I, this is, I've been here five years and we've seen, um, you know, the city manager has been very cognizant in making sure that we've gotten enough staff. We've seen, example, when I started planning, we've added about six positions to planning. Mm -hmm. And then we've had it last year, we added a senior um, economic development project manager, which is mm -hmm. Jeff. Okay. And so, Example, hopefully once the general plan wraps up, Jeff is going to be a key staff working on the redevelopment and the real reimagine. So we continue to assess and um, they've been, the um, city manager's office has been very responsive whenever we go to ask for. <clears throat> and you're proposing to take up a higher level position to convert it to more of a fiscal yes. planner too. So that'll yes. help. So they're, they've got a plan to take some positions yeah. and put them at the high level planner position. So I think we yeah. just had that discussion yesterday on their budget. So n not necessarily needing more resources, but kind of repositioning some yeah. of the resources they have. Yeah. Okay. All right. Council Member Duff. I just want to make one comment to thank you for all your hard work. It's been a tremendous, you know, taking on transforming and the e e efficiencies and way things are done. All these text amendments, <coughs> historic preservation on and on is just a huge load that has been tackled and ongoing the last few years and I know it's been hard and and I just want to say you did a stellar job and the development of the staff that I've seen and being able to do this I think I'm very proud and I want to say thank you of the work that you've done in development services and in planning and um, recognize that hard work and you just stayed steady and stayed at it and very responsive to the nuances that council might have on a, a project to um, help people or projects. And I just want to say thank you for being very hands-on and taking on the entire visioning that's going to set course for our city. Um, thank you. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on to item 3A, uh, is to acknowledge receipt of board minutes. Do we have a motion? So, Okay, Councilmember Freeman, Councilmember Spillsbury is second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, item number four, list of uh, current events and conferences atten attended with council members. Uh, Councilmember, go for it. Sorry, is that okay? Yeah. I don't have anything. Change it up right here. I just want to make sure people know that in District 5 is the t tonight is the 2050 General Plan Open House at the Multi Generational Center from 5 to 8. So please attend if you have opinions on the future of Mesa. Thank you. Perfect. Councilmember Duff, yeah, let's do that. Right. <laughs> um, and District 4 is having their general plan um, public meeting on Saturday from 6 to 9 at the Charles Luster building. It's at 640 North Mesa Drive. 
please uh, join us in, uh, for this um, community input on the uh, general plan. And if you don't know what it's about and, and haven't been involved, that's okay. Please um, we'll break it down into your concerns, your neighborhood, whatever you're concerned about, and have conversations about it so we can develop a plan that um, satisfies everybody in our community and reflects those values. So as far as what I've been up to this last Tuesday um, at the yard, we had a coffee with the downtown engage engagement team. It was a public event in the middle of a downtown called the yard. And we have a downtown engagement team now that are former um, police officers and their job is in helping and assisting the businesses and patrons. They have a bright fuchsia. Looks like uh, Council Member Goforth is maybe part of that team today. <laughs> uh, shirts and uh, they, you'll often see them walking in and around downtown and um, please stop by and say thank you to Larry, Mike and Mac. They, I, I asked them if they enrolled in the Beat the Boss, the steps, um, you know, the and they haven't. Because <laughs> you'll be glad to hear that they haven't because oh, they yes. said they've been averaging about eight miles of walking <clears throat> a day. Yeah, it's so my water meters, the ones that beat us. Oh, They're walking 10 oh, miles a day. Oh, okay, okay, all right, well. <laughs> okay. um, also on that day and Tuesday afternoon, um, Jeff McVeigh and I hosted a uh, tour of downtown for the Mesa Leadership Group and um, it's always amazing to see all the developments and changes in downtown and talking with um, uh, <coughs> these future leaders uh, about what's going on and, and their input about our city. So thank you Jeff McVeigh. Yeah, it took a, a little bit of his time. Um, I attended the ADU text amendment um, a public meeting via Zoom the other night, on Tuesday night, I think it was. There's good questions from the attendees and an excellent job from the staff. Um, Mary and her team, thank you very much for having that engagement. Um, last night I attended the Matriarchs of Washington Park at MCC, an exhibition about the matriarchs in Washington Park, a segregated community in our in Mesa's history, and that art project was created by Bruce Nelson. It's at MCC's art gallery, and it is like museum quality as far as the display and they have it and they have the matriarchs of washington park but they also have from young students um, and their art looking at the future of matriarchs the future of uh, um, leadership and, and matriarchs in our society so it has the contrast of the our history and the future um, in, in mesa so um worthwhile and um a, a lot of us att attended the um uh event last night also put on by mesa pd and mesa public schools around teen violence in which the public was able to talk about their concerns we heard even from students and it was very uh, moving it was very uh, a deep subject and i appreciate the work uh, i see chief costs here this morning Thank you for the conversations. I think it's the first step we can um, have as a community to come together around teen violence and what we can do to make our community safer and, and better. Thank you. All right. Councilor Ernst Willsbury. Yeah, um, just I'll add on to that. I want to um, spe specifically mention um, Chief Cost and um, Superintendent Porlis um, for tackling that last night. It was a rough meeting. It was hard. There's lots of emotion there, a lot of um, anger, a fear. Um, but I think it was really good for the community to come together and to be able to voice some of that. And I just so appreciate that our city, our police department, our school districts are trying to stay on top of this and come out ahead of it and um, in, in light of what's going on in, in the East Valley. And so I just really, really appreciate that that happened. And um, it's huge, huge showing from your police department last night. It's always just so impressive to me how many people um, take the time to come to those events. And when you had everyone stand up, <laughs> I think people were just shocked to see how many, um, how many, how many people were there from the staff of the Mesa Police Department. And it was just kind of an incredible moment to see that support. So. Thank you for that. Um, the chamber had their first Java with Giles um, of 2024 at Meineke, which is on Greenfield and University. Um, and I was able to attend that and we just gave an update um, to those business owners that were there as part of the chamber event to um, tell them about what's going on in District 2 and um, across the city. So I wanted to thank them for that. All right. 
Anything else? Councilor Summers? Uh, since we all reminded everybody, the general plan open house for District 6 will be on Friday. And that's at the uh, Gilbert Community Education Center, 6839 East Guadalupe Road. Date night. D that's a date night? <laughs> uh, 6 to 9 p.m. There you go. Perfect. All right. Hearing nothing else, um, item number five, Mr. Ready, can you share a schedule of future meetings? Yeah, just to remind you, you've covered all the uh, general plan meetings. So that's great. So the next council meeting will be on Monday, March 4th at 515. We'll see you then. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Councilmember Summers, second by Councilmember Duff. All in favor say aye. Aye. And we're adjourned. Thank you.